Chapter 3. Practical Magic Sawyer gently touched his forehead with two curious fingers. One fell away, and the other was left standing alone. It was amazing how a body, especially the body of a little boy, could heal. Though he hadn't thought about the scar he had gotten on his forehead that day for ages, now he couldn't even feel it anymore. He got up and looked into the circular mirror near the large computer monitor, but aside from the memory of breaking into the barn, it were as though it had never existed. When the rope broke and it sent Sawyer crashing, he hid his head on something that had been unearthed in all of his rummaging. Copious gooey blood was quick to turn it unrecognizable, though. That was okay, despite a bruised body gushing blood while freezing. On that day, everything turned out to be all right. Jubilant, the little doggy ran into his arms, warming him with kisses that washed away the pain, and he couldn't have been happier than being that way. There was a curt knock. Without pause, the door opened, giving him a start. Sawyer tried to cover by putting his hand into his pocket as he withered away from the mirror. He was the doctor. He vaguely recognized the face, despite having forgotten his name. How old is Robbie again? was his leading question as he shuffled over to the computer. It came alive with a few staccato button clicks and the dash of a mouse. A full-body x-ray appeared on the monitor. Though the screen went a bit blurry, and he'd never seen his poor little one depicted that way, there was no need for an introduction. Sawyer knew who they were looking at. He squinted to clearly make out the skeleton bones and soft hazy tissue in the middle of his babe's chest. The doctor pointed as he began to speak. It had been quite a night. Though Robbie had seizures before, still it had been quite an evening. The first few had caught him off guard completely, but after they began and it was clear they were going to be a thing, Sawyer's senses went on a state of ready alert. Any strange sound could bring a reprise of his wildly beating heart as a lump rocked into his throat and he jumped out of his seat. Thankfully, most times finding the babe safe and sound, he was so happy to be mistaken and Robbie would look up to him with innocent eyes as though he were being silly. It would kill him if Bubs knew what he was thinking, but it was easy to interpret for the worst. And how does one not if reaction happens first? Sawyer bit his lip. To be forewarned, he became attuned to the finer things, subtle clues like the way the little doggy would stare out into deep space, looking at nothing in particular, at least nothing a boy could see. He wondered if indeed there were deeper meanings, gods and battles to be fought with demons, or if zoning out was a prelude to fading away. In any case, that was how things started. At least that's how it seemed. Sawyer had looked into it, but thus far from searches undertaken, due to limited resources, leads were nebulous and answers uncertain. Still, it was why he wanted him near. If they were always close, if they could remain connected, then maybe somehow he could stop the violent seizures better than the drugs that failed again and again. He didn't know. It was all he had to hold on to. Robbie, if not calm, would stay brave in the fight. And the worst were that way. Horrible fights. Sawyer saw it in the big green eyes that became wide as his poor little one tensed, thrashing violently while straining to steady a convulsing head as he drooled and sometimes peed and sometimes defecated, waging war, He fought to regain control of a body that was betraying him. But more, more than becoming lost in battle, in that sad state, the babe would seek out hazel eyes, reining in chaotic energy while summoning the strength to crawl, demanding mutinous legs to comply as jittering paws strained to bring order and make it over to the boy. Earlier that evening, though, after the run-in with Big Brother at dinner, things had been very different. In the midst of waging war, Wild, chattering teeth chomped invisible chunks of air out of evil spirits, but then surrendered. Embroiled in the battle of the ages, the little one stopped fighting. He just gave up. And though always one with labored breaths, on that night he didn't appear to be breathing. It made Cole recoil in disgust, but he didn't care. Fuck him. Sawyer thought he was dead, though he would never admit that to anyone, least of all himself. It was true. He couldn't help it. Feelings arrived before thought. Rocketed by instinct, the boy did the very opposite, the very opposite of normal. He didn't coo or beg or plead. He didn't transport the babe to a darker place. 
shielding poor green eyes with silent prayers that things would be better. He didn't retreat, but fought. Fought back with all his might, yelling and screaming for his little one at the very top of his lungs, calling out, demanding the babe, demanding him to come home. And, after what felt like an eternity, after moments when even Cole was struck silent and stunned by Sawyer's force, Robbie did. The little doggy looked into concerned hazel eyes with an innocent tilt of his head that couldn't have said more. Robbie had that way about him. He always had eyes for him. Just the most beautiful green eyes ever. Not that Sawyer had always noticed. Things were that way, too, way back when, long before they broke into the potato barn, when a certain little doggy was delivered to a certain little boy. At least they were for Robbie, that is. For him, upon seeing Sawyer, it was an instant love affair. It was like the rest of the family didn't exist, and he was so very happy. Nothing of the sort. The delivering part had been carried out by the grumbling Grandpa Ben, albeit begrudgingly. His mom had been there too, mostly to ease his dour mood, which the squirming little puppy had been thoroughly oblivious to. At first sight, he made a bee line, bounding for the little boy, barking and panting up a storm before jumping all over him. Then, after scooping up a bald sock, which was thrashed about as if he were a cuddly crocodile set on destruction, the babe dropped it in favor of licking the boy's face while making havoc with his hair. Still, despite giggling, even as a young child, Sawyer could feel the heat from tensions rising. Tossing a fetch, he watched his mom move a distraught Grandpa Ben into the other room. Through the door, he could feel the fire. He's all right, Sawyer confided later that evening when his mom had come into his bedroom after a gentle knock. But when's the big one going to get here? Darling, there's no other dog. Upon arrival of their mommy, the enthusiastic little pup bounded over a pillow. Legs softer than jelly fell out from under, slumping him into a puppy pose with tail wagging high in the air. But I don't like him, a young Sawyer confided in a whisper while looking over his shoulder at the big dog fortress that had been fashioned at the foot of his bed from all the spare pillows and comforters he could find. Sawyer, please give him a chance. For me? she asked patiently as Robbie turned his attention on ripping at the corner of one of her sofa cushions. It now served as the drawbridge for safe passage over the molten moat of magma that surrounded Sawyer's bed, which blocked out evil wizards and ogreish creatures. Boiling volcanic bubbles burst into toxic steam as thick clouds of sulfuric acid rose over his room. It wasn't like his mom could practice magic or anything. Still, he didn't know how else it could have happened and couldn't remember exactly when, but there came a time when he didn't resent the exuberant little doggy jumping all over him while fighting dragons or his endless kisses when they won. Despite Cole's teasing, there came a time when he didn't think about big dogs anymore. This did nothing but upset Grandpa Ben, who came back for the little dog only to be told as such and that he was going to stay. Spying from the den window, Sawyer couldn't hear the full conversation before the old man huffed down the driveway after slamming the front door. Robbie had been spying too. Though at the time almost impossible to realize, the Grandpa incident would come to be the very early beginnings of their second secret mission. The first, of course, was the potato barn. Yet, years later, soon after the rusted orange lock had succumbed to its fate of being a forgotten relic buried in the bushes and they found their way in, Sawyer thought back, remembering with curious interest that, curiously enough, his grandpa was not all that interested in the potato barn way back then. As he marched off, he didn't even glance back in the general direction. Maybe he was just really upset, he wondered aloud, looking down at Robbie, who tilted his head, considering too. Later that night, his mom seemed to confirm the suspicion. She told him not to be mad at Grandpa Ben, who had been distraught over losing his dad, Nate, who had just passed away. Then, one day, years after that, upon finding the two alone in the potato barn, she would secretly admit that great-grandpa Nate's last words, his deathbed final and only wish, which he made his son... Ben, swear on his very life would be fulfilled, was that the then eight-week-old puppy, already named Robbie, be given to his great-grandson, Sawyer, immediately. So years later, it made perfect sense that Grandpa Ben would be upset on that day. After all, his father had just died and all. But what never made sense was that his grandpa, who had once been an upbeat, kind, elderly man, began to bear the ugly burden of resentment over Robbie. Robbie and the old neglected barn, of course. After the two got the potato barn open, 
It would remain that way for years. Not that Sawyer didn't turn back and think of closing it. But the little dog, he continued on his march back home, crunching leaves as if to say he had no desire to go through that again. And the boy, with a balled-up shirt applying pressure to his forehead that had finally stopped bleeding, had to agree. From then on, the converted potato barn remained a permanently open fixture that he and their friends would pass obliviously on some days while tromping to and from the swimming ground or venture into on others. Inside, during their younger years, the kids would play hide-and-seek, which was something that Robbie had been particularly fond of. Whether by scent or some other unknown innate ability, he had a particular knack for seeking. On a mission, the little doggy would lead, traversing nooks and crannies into hidden layers of the humongous junk-filled barn, guiding the two through never-before-seen mazes into the mysterious depths. Uncovering buried secrets, his travels would take him places where being small wasn't a shortcoming, though through some that could be too small even for a young boy to follow. Robbie, Robbie, Sawyer would call out in whispers so as not to reveal their position, and the little oracle would come thumping back to help him find the way. Sometimes he and Sawyer would crouch, suppressing giggles at the feet that came scampering by while missing them by inches. Robbie could find all the greatest hideaways. Other times, it would be every man for himself, which was what Cole called it and preferred to play, claiming that forming teams was the worst sort of cheating. This, of course, was when he wasn't too busy with his more important things. Sawyer didn't know about that, but certainly didn't feel much like a man. Plus, there were girls in the group, and of course, most importantly, a little doggy too. Still, he refrained from stating the obvious and let the old idiom stand, even though it was pretty weird. Man or not, when they couldn't be a duo, Robbie could run and hide with the best of them. He was stellar at finding secret spots with great stealth that never gave him away. In the hunt, as kids became entrenched in a losing battle and frustration grew, the devious babe would taunt with confusing clues by scratching at things that created distant echoes. He could make strange sounds that seemed to emanate from even stranger locations, like nowhere, and in no way could have emanated from a little doggy, or so it seemed. Then, he would forfeit his position, sticking his head out with a jovial bark and the most canine-like growl ever, nipping at misdirected feet before scampering off to find an even better hiding place. This would send the kids dizzy, giving them the giggles as they spun on their heels saying, Over here! Over here! While laying in chase, hot on the trail of the Spectra who, yet again, had disappeared. They played all sorts of games like that. Games like Keep Away, which highlighted Robbie's natural fetching abilities, or hot potato, which always felt fitting, despite no one ever stumbling across a potato in the so-called potato barn. Not even one. Not that he didn't look. But when Robbie, too, had come up empty, unable to find any, it was a sure bet they no longer existed. One day, a time later, a wide-eyed Sawyer was told that the older kids had been sneaking into the barn and not for potatoes. That happened during super late evenings, way past his bedtime, at a time when midsummer nights gave birth to balmy mornings and the clabbered walls radiated heat. It was reported that one teen got to wear a dirty old lab coat that had been found in the barn and used for cleaning muddy flip-flops, while the other, in only her nightgown, would lay on a workbench and pretend to be his patient with nothing underneath. With nothing underneath! With nothing underneath. Though some giggled over the gory details, calling the whole act weird and even gross. Sawyer's eyes widened, quietly considering the information with mixed pangs of strange new sensations as the barn was rattled by grenades and a kid fired his assault rifle, killing him dead on the spot. War had been great and was another game that Cole, who was absent more and more those days, had informed was real man sport. He taught them how to break down imaginary M16s. It was funny. Not funny funny, but strange funny. He couldn't remember what Robbie did when they played war. He racked his brains, but nothing. In any case, when the kids grew weary of destroying stuff that littered the potato barn by appropriating them for bombs or pretending they were tanks in games that morphed into smash-up derbies, another of Cole's favorites, they would dismantle the old machines. Some were rusted solid or had broken to bits ages ago. Most were a mystery and so best served as ammunition. Some nights after the kids had gone, the two would sit alone on the compressed dirt floor to examine more than destroy the old doodads. It wasn't only Sawyer. Robbie had been interested, too. With a tilt of his head, the little doggy would paw at gadgets as the little boy wondered about how things must have been living in the olden times 
with all of that ancient stuff. He could only imagine how precious they must have been in light of how firmly his grandpa was on keeping them locked away, and so securely, and even broken. It was strange, though. Strange how now, to so many, they were just useless junk. So interesting to wonder if that were the fate of all things, to be a faded memory, to become relics of olden times in distant places. Mind ablaze and set fire, Sawyer went deep, daydreaming about lost stories and ancient wisdom, about artifacts and powerful old inventions that once were priceless and direly needed, yet destined never more to be, lost to the past, no longer cared for, forgotten to history. He wasn't alone. Robbie had joined him, staring out into space. It was on a night such as this, when Mom found them, the two, Sawyer and Robbie, rummaging through the old potato barn. Sensing things, she spilled the beans about great-grandpa Nate's dying wish. One hot summer, perhaps a year or two later, along with Rob, who had become quite fond of his new game of hunting sugar cubes that had fallen between the cracks of broken gizmos, Sawyer decided to open a lemonade stand, only to be lambasted by coal. It sat peacefully in the shade of the perennially open barn and went mostly unattended as he dog paddled out to the other kids in the middle of the swimming hole. On shore near the barn, the little doggy flew on a sugar high. His sibling, after questioning the merits of operating in a self-serve sector, had been mildly happy enough upon seeing his entrepreneurial spirit, as he called it, that he went through the motions of setting up an entire liquid refreshment business plan before lecturing on the importance of a mission statement, as well as what he explained to be a profit and loss worksheet, an enterprise venture thingy, and stock stuff whatchamacallits, which Sawyer didn't much care about nor quite understand. Still, thinking it was for the best, he played along. He wanted to be in the good graces of his big brother, who, by that time, would pick fights with him for no apparent reason. That being the case, he never made mention to Cole that he wasn't charging for or taking money, but in fact giving the lemonade away, for free. That wouldn't have gone over well. Not at all. What also didn't go over well was the crusty, dilapidated padlock casing that Grandpa Ben stumbled upon when happening by one afternoon. Laying useless and lame after being bested by Sawyer and Robbie, the bulky monstrosity was destined to spend the rest of its days basking in the sun aside the perpetually open barn near the abandoned lemonade stand. Upon sight of the broken shackle in the grass grinning rusty, the old man went haywire. He furiously slammed the humongous barn door closed, which sent sugar cubes flying. Then, embroiled in an angry fit, the old man heaved the old tractor some fifty yards over to the barn, muttering foul words while straining to secure the place. Not that anyone who had half a mind couldn't have pushed it away, even a kid. That would have been pretty easy at the time, considering the tractor's large rear wheel was yet to donate its rubber tire to the tree swing, which was no more than a rope way back then. If the old man's grand ovation was a statement of some sort, the gesture was lost on Sora and Robbie. They were fixated on other things. For the boy, it was the tractor and all the possibilities that the rediscovery had presented. He watched from the tree, whose canopy shaded part of the swimming hole, as the little doggy ran in to scoop up newly fallen sugar cubes. They had browned and become soggy shortly after the lemonade stand had gone abandoned, but no matter. Meanwhile, Grandpa Ben marched off towards the house, steam from sweat pouring down his tremor-ridden face. Inside, as always, his mom sat ready and waiting. That was the second time he found the potato barn open. Looking up from her book as he stormed the den, after storming the front door and then the kitchen, his mom lied. It was simple as that. Later, she told Sawyer that it was just a small fib to save him the heartache and grief. She calmed Grandpa Ben by saying that it had only been open since morning and not for the some three-odd years or so. Sawyer had been lax on closing it, and lax was really more of a euphemistic statement. The damn thing was a beast. It was heavy. When he started to ask about the lock, though, she recounted the facts that her little one had relayed late that evening after limping home with Robbie while mending the gash on his forehead, that it had broken off and was a piece of junk and should have been thrown away. Then, in a way that turned the old man's hard-wrinkled face sheepish, she castigated him for not having a proper lock or noticed it had gone missing. After making him grovel, accomplished by a simple glance down at her page, not that she was actually reading, his mom granted forgiveness. Graciously, she took him by hand to buy a new padlock that afternoon. Then, 
with him firmly planted in the passenger seat. Upon wanting to keep both keys, she gave him a look which turned the old man boyish and made him melt yet again. Sawyer's mom smiled as she gave him the update that evening. He's silly, he said, thinking about his grandpa's silly crush on his mom, and the goofy smile which would come over the old man's face when his daughter-in-law led him around in her powerful yet very feminine way. No, it's sweet, she corrected in full sincerity. Coincidentally, he and Robbie were still out at the swimming hole when Grandpa Ben came sauntering back with his shiny new padlock. By then, the kids had moved in on the old tractor. The biggest money can buy, he proclaimed, proudly snapping the frowning shackle closed while failing to notice that the old tractor, no longer needed to stand guard at the door, sat lame with a rear tire missing. After climbing over it like monkeys on a jungle gym, pumping the pedals and ratcheting the steering wheel, the kids pretended to drive it, with manic fingers managing to free a few stuck knobs while fiddling with the switches. This was before coming to the realization that the stubborn heap wasn't about to start. Second best, with subsequent plans to dismantle the contraption completely, they got as far as yanking off the large rear tire. That was all right. It still felt like a victory. Then, in a ceremony, it was marched out to the pond, most triumphantly. Sawyer couldn't help but smile. It wasn't at his grandpa, who turned the brightest shade of red while struggling to push the gimby wheeled heap some fifty yards back into the woods, where it was soon to be buried by leaves and perhaps lost for more decades. But at the shiny new padlock, the old one was definitely larger. That night, while doing geography homework and looking at the expansive maps that covered his desk, with nothing but darkness flooding in from his picture window, there was a gentle knock at the door. After a polite pause, his mom gently opened it and came in. She knew it would be okay with the both of them. Maybe try to keep it closed most of the time, she asked sweetly, while handing him a shiny new key with a kiss on his forehead. On his lap, Robbie stood on hind legs, wagging his tail. He wanted to be kissed, too. Sawyer returned her forlorn eyes, then somberly looked down at the map. Printed on a thin sheet of creased paper, it was a mere skeleton representation of a small part of the world. Nothing more than that. No more than sketchy clues. How can this explain things? Anything? All that lay buried, Sawyer asked under his breath, looking into the little doggy's green eyes that were glazed over too. I'll never understand. His mom whispered as the door gently closed behind her. The click of a fashionable gold insignia pen punctuated the doctor's words. As he pointed to the x-ray on the screen, he spoke in disjointed phrases about it being congenital and a faulty heart valve. The scientific-sounding words were quickly said, never heard, and slipped away to be forgotten completely. Sawyer's jaw must have dropped, but nothing came out, so the doctor continued. His heart has expanded and is pushing his organs into his abdomen most probably exacerbated by the seizures. Surely you've noticed his trouble breathing, the sterile man in a stark white lab coat stated dispassionately. We can't replace it. We don't operate on dogs. No one does, he added before the boy could think to ask. Sawyer looked back blankly, hazel eyes well past blurry. Maybe some kids are playing doctor, he said to Rob, joyously taking in the big green eyes that glowed looking up to him in the amber light. At least that's what he had first thought while turning to his little one, who wanted to be carried more than usual those days. After spotting the hulking door open, the two slowly approached the converted potato barn. His lone feet crunched leaves in the early summer evening. His mind, though, couldn't help but twist as their jovial approach was startled into distress. It sounded like there was someone inside and all right, but not kids. With Robbie bouncing in his arms, he shot off to the side, behind the corner, so they wouldn't be seen. Rob, maybe there was a reason for Grandpa's padlock. That's got to be why he was so pissed finding it open. It must be protecting something, something valuable. The little doggie didn't have a chance to answer, for Sawyer jumped from the deep rumble of a man's voice. Listen, did you hear that, Bubs? There is someone in there. What if they're stealing it? He asked in self-hushed whispers. The little babe in his arms looked up with kind eyes. Fine watchdog you turned out to be, he giggled. Instead of kissing, though, Robbie pricked up his ears, recognizing. Sawyer listened intently. It was a voice they both knew. Now, not from fear, but to go unnoticed, they tiptoed, slinking along the rough clapboard exterior towards the open door. It was his parents. They were the ones inside. His mom must have made a duplicate of his duplicate key. 
maybe they're maybe they're talking about Cole and his annoying new girlfriend, the Deb. Ugh. Oh, she's so pompous. Sawyer whispered to the little one with a devious smile. But oh God, please don't let it be about me. Damn it, I don't want to go to that stupid tool university. I don't know why I even sent off that dumb application, he added, which brought about another snicker. Well, maybe only because Cole couldn't get in. Sawyer giggled between a barrage of little doggy kisses, but they were quick to stop after the realization that the emanating sounds didn't resonate. I know this is silly, his mom said, weeping. It's not, his dad comforted. Oh, what's wrong with me? Come here, he said softly. I'm sorry. I'm just being emotional. Stop. Are you going to tell me? He asked with a gentle lilt. Sawyer was on pins and needles. He wanted to know, too. It's just that. When I saw him this morning, he looked up to me, and he smiled at me, and I saw that his middle tooth had gone missing, and I said, Oh, baby, you lost your tooth lost your tooth last night <laughs> and he, I knew he didn't know and if he did it wouldn't have bothered him but it hurt me so it hurt me so much so much so that I started crying after I left Sawyer's room Sawyer was stunned Robbie had lost a tooth his babe had lost a tooth and he didn't notice it how could he have not noticed he looked down at Robbie, in brief glimpses between kisses, Sawyer saw for himself. And I, don't, and I just don't know how or why that could happen, she continued. And it made me feel so old. <laughs> and it made me realize that Robbie was too... As a lump formed in Sawyer's throat, she broke down, and he felt nothing save for the pain in his right arm, which shot like a bolt of lightning down his back as he sunk, coming to rest with the back of his head against the barn and the babe in his arms. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. But she continued through tears as the color fell from Sawyer's face. Have you heard his breathing? Have you seen? Have you seen? Have you seen? The nurse came in without knocking. She held Robbie, who, upon seeing Sawyer, scrambled in her arms and clawed to get back into his. He's wonderful. We all think so. With a frugal click, the doctor put the computer to sleep, then placed several medicine bottles into a small white bag, which was sealed with a neat fold. Instructions inside, he said, handing it over. So this will make him better? The boy asked naively. The doctor glanced at the nurse furtively. Are your folks around? Why? Sawyer's response was sharp and not a question. It's just that maybe it would be best if we spoke to an adult. He didn't know what to say, and Robbie didn't give him that chance, for, as they had when they were kids, seeking those poor, soon-to-be-found hiders hidden in secret places, his nose pointed them out the door. In his arms, the little doggy wound them through sanitary hallways, turning his head before they turned corners, past the cute nurse with a feminine body, who bid them goodbye, but who they were both oblivious to, and passed the blackened windows, which still revealed not a thing. They shot out of the sliding doors, which opened for them magically, and then out into the night, where they felt a cool breeze on their skin, and looked up into the nebulous sky that seemed to have more stars than ever. And suddenly, very suddenly, he was happy. And he could tell his little one, if for no other reason than being free of that temporary prison that dogs universally hate, was happy too. Robbie looked up to the stars as if to say thanks. There, standing there, Sawyer did too. Thank you for my babe, and thank you for an answer, he whispered to the heavens. He was referring to a question that his dad had always asked, though perhaps only rhetorically, yet never got an answer. Sawyer looked out at a numinous sky. He knew that though his parents might have been right, it was conceivable that Cole had been too. Or perhaps they were all wrong, and the answer lay somewhere in between. He didn't know. He really couldn't say. Everything looked sketchy, like the skeleton lines of a map with no details filled in. Though they meant well, and that it was sure to make his mom cry, he knew that at least a small part of him couldn't remain a child any longer. 
He was growing older, and life was changing. And if he wanted to have the only thing that really mattered, that meant anything at all in the great big world, then it was time for him to change too. Standing under the vibrant stars, with Robbie in his arms, Sawyer, so like his dad, and so unlike Cole, couldn't answer the question. He had no idea what he wanted to be when he grew up. But he did know one thing. He knew where they were headed.